I will trust in you, and I will not be ashamed. Hi, everybody. But I'm going to do something else here that, uh, I don't know, I think it's a good idea. So we'll see what a few of you think when you respond. Uh, I'm going to talk about some big ideas that have really had an influence on my life, and I actually think are important for um, all believers to understand. And certainly, uh, I, I think that, that many of these ideas that I'm going to be discussing on these videos are things that are coming to the church, things that Jesus is leading in. So the first one is this, is that there is a distinction between the kingdom and the church. There's a distinction between the kingdom of God and even the church of God, and that it's possible to be in the church and not be in the kingdom of God, um, but the kingdom of God always includes the true church, and so you can't equate one to the other. And very often, people are more concerned about the church that they're involved in, and they're very excited about their church and their, their, the ministry of the pastor, the ministry of the youth, or whatever it is. Nothing wrong with that, necessarily, but we're missing this bigger picture of what this whole thing is about. And the way that this particularly works in pastors' lives is that it's all about growing your church and making sure that your church is important. And someone who really does a great job of redefining uh, what should be the mission of every believer, including every pastor, is this guy Carl Medeiros. And I don't know if you can see that, but he has a book called Speaking of Jesus, and it is really absolutely brilliant. It really does talk a lot about how to share Christ and what that means, but uh, several of his ideas are connected to this big idea that, hey, it's about Jesus. It's not about the vineyard. It's not about a particular pastor or ministry or anything else but Christ. And so let me just share a couple of his big ideas because I, I don't want to spoil you reading this book if you're going to do that. But if you're not going to read this book, then these are a couple of things to really grab onto. He begins with an illustration where he talks about, uh, you know, the, the basically back and forth contrariness and um, rivalries between different religious groups. So imagine that um, all these different rivalries, the Christians against the Muslims, the Buddhists against the atheists, whatever it would be, they're all kind of contending to capture the hearts and minds of the people on, the pl on planet Earth, right? And he goes, imagine if everything was settled by a soccer match. Of course, he calls it football. He's an American, but he's lived abroad most of his life. So he goes, imagine if you know, it was Team Christian against Team Agnostic and Atheist. And you know, in the past, Team Christian was really doing well, but recent times, there's a lot more agnostics and atheists, and so they're gonna come together and have this football match. And then right over here, we have Team Muslim, and we have Team Hindu, and they're also playing another soccer match over here, and who's gonna win, and isn't it all exciting? And here's Carl Maderis' great insight. All of a sudden, a figure steps onto the field and disrupts the game between Team Christian and Team Atheist. And this person isn't paying attention to all the things that are going on, the passing, the strategy, all the activity. He's started to approach different players, and he does it equally. He goes to Team Atheist and talks to them. He goes to Team Christian and talks to them, and then he brings them off of the field. He's going to the Muslim versus the, the Hindu game and doing the exact same thing. And what's his point? What is Carl Madera trying to get to? Something absolutely brilliant. And that is, is that Jesus is not into playing our games. And he is calling people from all kinds of different places to come and follow him. And coming and following him is what matters, not that you claim that you're on Team Christian or that you're doing a bunch of apologetics against this other group and you're gonna tell them everything that's wrong with them and hoping that somehow if you tell every, someone everything that's wrong with them, they'll suddenly go, oh my gosh, you're right. This is everything that's wrong with me, so I wanna be like you. And, and this is a, the powerful theme in this book that we're not trying to get people to become good vineyard people or belong to the vineyard church. Nothing wrong with that, beautiful, wonderful if they did. Hope that we can receive them, hope that they can join in, hope that we can do a good job loving them the way our Father wants us to love them. All that's great. But there's a bigger mission, and that is that we're calling people to follow Jesus and enter into his kingdom, which is going to be very different than the kingdom of an individual ministry, denomination, or church. Uh, I, I don't have time to go on about why I think this is such a compelling idea, but I'm going to use one more illustration 
from this book. And this is not something that Carl Medeiros made up. This is something that actually happened to him. He was living in the Middle East for many, many years, primarily in Lebanon, but also in, in Egypt, um, sharing Jesus, talking about Jesus to all kinds of different people, but especially Muslim people. And he was very successful. But eventually he moved back to Colorado, which where he was from, and he started pastoring in a vineyard church in Colorado. And Carl, at one particular point, was asked if he would be a part of this interfaith discussion group. And it was going to include, you know, um, two Muslim leaders, two rabbis, and then they wanted a Catholic, and they wanted a Protestant. And they asked if he would represent the Protestant point of view. And he said, nope, I won't represent the Protestant point of view, but I can come and talk about Jesus. And I just want to read you a little portion of what happened that particular night. It says, it was a funny night. Several hundred people crowded in the hall as introductions began. Uh, I sat at the far left end of the panel. At the other end were two Muslims. In the middle were two rabbis, then the bishop, and then me. Introductions went like this. The honorable Muslim Sheikh Imam Yusuf Al-Amadi, leader of Colorado Springs Islamic Society. Next, Dr. Sheikh and leading thinker Imam Ali bin Muhammad, president of American Muslim Society of Imams, and other really important things. Then the two rabbis, Rabbi Yosef Gurin, of insert the name of the synagogue, that sounds very important, and the first woman rabbi in Colorado, the founder and president of the most amazing something or other that I can't remember. He's being funny, by the way. Finally, they introduced the bishop, a man immortalized as the Catholic leader of Colorado Springs since the beginning of time. And then the host came to me and said, and this is no lie, and finally, we have, um, we have um, Carl. The name's Carl, I said. He was obviously embarrassed not to know my title or my great accomplishments, of which I have neither. So he just said, Mr. Carl, and everyone laughed. Each of us was supposed to answer two questions, and each of us had um, three to five minutes to respond. The first question was, how does your religion get you to heaven? Good question. The two Muslim guys did a fine job of articulating the various views of Islam, uh, Islam excuse me, on which takes you to heaven, which comes down to the will of God alone. The two Jewish rabbis did a great job of explaining the uncertainty of life after death within Judaism, hence the focus on life, uh, uh, life of faith here and now. The Catholic bishop also did a very good job helping everyone to understand the various Christian interpretations of the afterlife and how to get there. And then it was my turn. Believe me, I was praying for wisdom and something significant to say. And this is what came out. Actually, my religion doesn't get you to heaven. I should have probably explained or added to that, but that's what I said. The other panelists shifted uncomfortably in their seats, and the host asked if I'd like to explain a little more. Sure, I said. It's just that I've never seen a religion save anyone. Our religions are great at laying out some basic rules, do's and don'ts, that are good for our lives, and they um, don't really provide any hope or any kind of eternal security. It seems that religions end up causing more trouble than they're solving. So then ask the host, how do you get to heaven? All this seems so basic that I thought I might as well go ahead and state the obvious. Well, it's Jesus, and he does it, and he didn't start a new religion. He came to provide us a model of life and a way to God. He is it. Believing and following him is the way. He takes us to heaven and not a religion. On to simple question number two. How does your religion deal with terrorism? The two Muslims felt a little defensive about the question, but did a nice job of denouncing all forms of terrorism and explaining how the Quran does not provide a place for it. The Jewish rabbis spent most of their time to, trying to convince the two Muslims that they had misread their own book on the subject. And the bishop gave a lovely talk about mixing um, mercy with justice. And here's what I said. I don't really know. I'm not really sure how the religion I grew up in would or should deal with terrorism. But I do have some thoughts on how Jesus might deal with terrorists, because he had two with him in his inner circle, a zealot and a tax collector, a political insurgent and an economic terrorizer of the common folk. 
And what he did with, with the two of them was bring them in as confidence, as students, as disciples. Then he made them apostles in the early faith. It actually seems to me that the worse someone was, the more Jesus wanted them to follow him. He didn't just have mercy, as we think of it, as a sweet and sappy, lovey-dovey sort of thing. It was mercy with a bite. Mercy that led people out of where they were and into a new place. This is what Jesus did with the worst of his day, and he was really only uh, hard on the ones, uh, types of folk like us, the religious folk. He looked down, I looked down the line and smiled. People like me, hypocrites and such. I'm sure at this point they were all wondering why they didn't bite at me. We did answer question, we did answer and question for about 20 minutes more and then wrapped it up. Two things happened at the end of the night that made it all worthwhile. A little crowd of people around me uh, in front started asking questions. Some happy, some angry, some others just slightly confused. One woman was more than a little upset with me and obviously, uh, I'd obviously shaken up the box which she kept her faith and she needed to tell me a few things. Our conversation went something like this. You didn't even mention the Trinity, she said. True, I replied, but I didn't think I was talking about that and it didn't come up in the course of the conversation. So that wasn't good enough. But surely you believe in the Trinity, don't you? And some other things that you didn't mention that you should have, like atonement, I knew that I needed to tread lightly with her. Everyone lives in a context and needs to be sensitive to uh, the context of others. She was an American Christian and she had something to say to me and I needed to listen. So I simply said, you're probably right. And of course, I believe everything that's in the book. I held up my Bible, showing her that it appeared well read. Then uh, next to her, a young man could hardly contain himself. He blurted out, I'm a Muslim. I came with the Imam tonight and from, from his mosque, and he invited me to come. He turned and addressed the woman who had been speaking. and said, if this man had talked about theology or doctrine, even Christianity, I wouldn't be interested. I've heard that from my Christian friends, but he talked about Jesus in a way I'd never heard before, and I thought it was amazing. At that moment, the local imam, who was engaged in plenty of interesting conversations at the end of the stage, came up and said, Carl, Carl, Carl. You had an unfair advantage. He was smiling, but he was also wagging his finger in my face. I wasn't sure where this was going. What's that, sir? I asked timidly. While we were all busy defending our religion and our positions, you simply talked about Jesus. You cheated. And then he let out a huge laugh and slapped me on the back and said, good job, walk away. And he walked away. Why is this? A big thought speaking of Jesus uh, because we have spent far too much time trying to defend ourselves our ideas instead of representing him there's a difference between defending our church and then talking about Jesus and one is is that our church probably has all sorts of failings certainly there are a few that I'm aware of but Jesus doesn't need our defending he he's able to defend himself because he is truly innocent so there's great power in representing him. So let me just finish with one final story, and that is when I first came to this church, I was aware of its great history and past. I had done so much in missions, how it had been a successful church since the beginning of the Vineyard Movement, and I was excited about that. But we had a meeting with um, some people who were visiting the church for the first time. I think we called it pizza with the pastors, and it was really a welcoming type lunch. And I'm sitting there with the staff that I knew but didn't know very well. And each one of them began going around and saying, this is why I came to the vineyard and this is why I love the vineyard. And all of a sudden, as I listened to two or three of them speak, the word vineyard, vineyard, vineyard just was ringing in my head. And as we finished the meeting and it went very well, and I went home and I began to pray and I said, God, why did that bother me? That I just heard vineyard, vineyard, vineyard. And I realized that the vineyard, even if it was the greatest church in the world, would never be enough to satisfy someone's needs, their heart, their soul, their mind, for salvation, and most of all, for being able to provide new life from God here and now. So I went back and I said, I understand that we love the vineyard, but when we're in these meetings, from now on, staff, I want you to talk about Jesus. 
wants you to talk about he, how he changed your life, how he's in your life, and how he's leading you in your life. And that provided a completely different context to go forward. This is a really big idea. Jesus gets us out of all of our games, internal, external, religious, and otherwise. He calls us to follow him, and we get to call others to do the same. And we represent him. We don't need to defend him. God bless you. Have a wonderful day. Hope that big idea hangs in your head and hangs in your heart for a little while.